Welcome ladies and gentlemen, my name is Brian McLogan and in this video we're going to work through my notes that I provided to my class over complex zeros of polynomials. So this is the last section of our polynomials unit. We've already covered real rational zeros, real irrational zeros, and now we're going to get into complex zeros. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the complex numbers because this is a little bit of review from Algebra 2, but we will kind of, you know, expand upon them and at least do a quick little review. So. Uh, basically, what we're going to cover here um, in my notes is we're going to learn how to determine the complex zeros as well as multiplicity. Uh, we're going to learn how to find the, the remaining zeros when given zeros or factors. And we're going to have some new theorems, the rational zero test, Descartes' rule of signs, the fun and the fundamental theorem of algebra. So some important things that are going on that we have not discussed before. But And then also we're going to write the equation. But the first two and the last one is something we've already done before. We just did them with different types of zeros. So therefore, we have to understand, you know, what exactly is a you know complex zero. But before we kind of get into that, I started off my lesson with just giving some students um, you know, two problems to say, well, how do we find the zeros again if it's non-factorable and write the linear factorization? And this was a way for us to introduce students to our complex number system. And for the first example, this was very similar to what we did for the irrational number system. Um, but you know, you go ahead and set this equal to zero. And then we go ahead and you know solve, you subtract one, and then you quickly recognize, well, crap. Um, if I was gonna solve for x and I need to take the square root then of both sides, I can't take the square root of a negative number in our real number system. So therefore that brings us to our imaginary or a complex number system, where the square root of negative one is what we use to represent our imaginary unit i. And I'll bring up to that in the next slide, but that was something I wanted students to remember from our algebra two days. Um, and then we are going to practice writing the linear factorization because remember all polynomials can be written as a product of its factors. Now even though these factors produce irrational, or I'm sorry, complex zeros, we can still write the polynomial as a product of its two factors. And really the important thing, you know, the reason why I like to do this is not only so you can see the zeros from the factors rather simply, but then also so you can recognize this is a difference of two squares across complex numbers. Right, so you can see that um, how you can kind of quickly factor that because you know the point is I'd like students to be able to get to this point where they can factor that down without actually having to set it equal to zero and solve. Now the next example, um, we don't want to make the mistake of setting it equal to zero, right, and then go ahead and um, subtracting the three and then taking the square root because we have two values here. We have an x squared as well as having a x. So we can't go ahead and do that in this case. Um, however, what we do have in this case is we have a quadratic equation equal to zero. So therefore, what we can do in this case is um, if it's non-factorial, right, there's no two numbers that multiply to give us three as well as add to give us two. So what we can do in this case is use the quadratic formula. Because again, when we have a quadratic equal to zero, the quadratic formula gives us our solutions, right? Now I've already covered the quadratic formula um, in last lesson, so therefore I'm just gonna jump right into it. Um, but actually, you know, let's just write it out there one more time, just in case maybe, maybe you're coming across this and you didn't see the last video. So when we have a quadratic equal to zero, then we know the solutions to that equation are x equals opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four times a times c all over two times a. All right, so we will be doing quadratic formula again, so that's why I'm just gonna kinda pick this up. So negative two plus or minus, let's see, negative two, I'll write this one out just so we can make sure we're on the same page. Um, four times a times c, and actually I don't like doing this even when I'm teaching, even though I've already done this. I like to always write it out just to make sure I'm not missing any steps. So in this case, I have x equals negative two. Now I will do the, what we call the discriminant in my head. So, well not in my head, but negative two squared is four. Uh, negative four times three is a negative 12. So four minus uh, 12 is going to be a negative eight. There's divided by two. Now, one thing I wanted to recognize, you know, as students is remember the square root of negative one, we're using our imaginary unit i, right? So one thing that we can do here is, we've already talked about simplifying radicals last class period. And we can simplify the square root of eight here by really representing this as, you know, negative four, or negative one, I'm sorry, times four, times uh, two. 
right? And we don't really need to break this down every single time, but I just wanted you to see why I'm getting the answers that I am getting. Because we know, you remember the rules of radicals will allow us to break this up. So therefore, this can simplify down into negative two plus or minus. Well, the square root of negative one is i. The square root of four is two. Instead of writing i two, we write it as two times i. And then we have the square root of two. So that'd be two, square root of two, all over two. And then if we wanted to simplify this, we could divide the two into both of those terms. And therefore, we'd have negative one plus or minus the square root of two. Now, the last thing we need to do is just write the linear factorization. And a lot of students don't like this, so I'm just gonna write this out one more time because I know it gets a little confusing and it's really important. I'm sorry, I forgot to write the two. Oh, there's still an i there, isn't there? Um, just because I know students don't like solving it in this case. So remember, these are set equal to x. So x you know, is equal to, let's say, negative one plus i square root of two. So again, if you add this over, you add the one to the other side, and then you subtract the square root of two, you have x plus one minus i square root of two is equal to zero, right? So that is the zero, and then this is the factor. So therefore, I can write this in factored form as x plus i, I'm sorry, x plus one minus i square root of two, and then again, the other factor was, remember, this is plus or minus i. So if this was a negative i, then you'd be adding it. And then my other factored form would be 1, I'm sorry, x plus 1 plus i square root of 2. Okay, and you can go and work that out. Um, and I did that for the students, you know, just so they can see. Actually, you know, let's just work it out. Why not? Then at least I have it in here. So remember, it's plus or minus. There's one zero and there's another zero, right? And then you add the 1. Right, so then we have x plus one plus i square root of two equals zero. And now that you have the factors equal to zero, therefore you can go ahead and find the two factors. All right, so that just kind of brings us into remembering our imaginary unit. Um, i is equal to the square root of negative one. Um, the standard form is a plus b i, and I made a mistake here. That is supposed to be a negative i, so i cubed is negative, um, i cubed is negative i, i to the fourth is one, and then what we figured out is if you keep on going in algebra two, then it obviously just keeps on repeating itself. But we're not gonna practice our operations, at least right now, we're just kind of being able to um, introduce you know, students to it. But the main thing I want students to really remember, what they need to know, at least for this section, if i is equal to the square root of negative one, and i square both sides, Therefore, i squared is equal to negative one. So we're gonna basically be using these two identities, or these two ideas that i, the imaginary unit, is squared to negative one, and i squared is equal to negative one. That's what's gonna be most useful to us. However, you know, we previously have used like adding, subtracting, multiplying, you know, and that will come into, uh, you know, come to be helpful for us as we work on and later throughout this. All right, um, so now let's just go into zeros by factoring. So the first, last example, you know, we just did, we used the inverse operations as well as the quadratic formula. But obviously, if something is factorable, we always want to look into factoring. So in this case, what we're gonna do is we're going to factor it down and we're going to write the linear factorization. So we're going to find the zeros as well as, and I don't know why I didn't write that in there. So let's just write this as um, find the zeros and then write the linear factorization. All right. So in this first one, um, again, when we're finding the zeros, you know, this is gonna be useful to, to set this equal to zero. Um, and I really don't like things when they're not in standard form. So I'm going to set this in standard form and I'm gonna subtract out the negative. And the reason why I'm doing that is because you can see that this is now a difference of two squares. But be careful, it's a difference of two squares raised to the fourth power, right? So it's not gonna be x minus one, x plus one. However, it will be x squared minus one and x squared plus one. Um, so therefore zero equals a negative x squared minus one and an x squared plus one. And the important thing is you probably want to recognize this if you didn't subtract out that negative one, right? So I think it's helpful, that's why to always subtract it out so you have a, co you know, a coefficient there, and then you can factor it from there. 
Now, uh, my goal here is for you to be able to, you know, factor this without having to do the zero product property. However, some students still need to kind of go back and set them equal to zero, which is fine. You know, x squared minus one equals zero. You know, x squared plus one is equal to zero. Add the one, x equals plus or minus one. Subtract the one, you get x equals plus or minus i, right? So you can use that identity and then go ahead and write the factors. The only issue here is when you write that linear factorization, make sure you don't forget that zero here, right? So therefore I have f of x, is equal to a negative, I'm gonna write, just write the linear factorization here real quick. This would be x minus one times x plus one. Actually, you know what, let's just write it out as set equal to zero. There, at least I at least provided it. And this would be x minus i times x plus i. Okay, and therefore the zeros now, I can just write a little bit easier, are plus or minus one and plus or minus i. Now, one thing I started doing with my students, I started writing, like, let's count all the zeros. Well, in this case, we have four zeros, right? Two are real and two were complex, but there are still four of them. And notice the degree of that polynomial is four. Interesting. Now let's move into a trinomial. Now we practice again trinomials, um, thinking about these as far as factoring them to a quadratic. So whenever I see a trinomial, you know, a couple things I know. First of all, I know that if it's factorable, it can be factorable to a product of two binomials. And if it's not in quadratic form, then I want to maybe rewrite it in quadratic form. So therefore I could see what that, if you know, would it be factored formed into. And this is factorable to, let's see, x plus four times x plus two. So therefore the numbers are gonna be the same, x plus four and x plus two. The only difference is, you know, I want x times x to give me x to the fourth. So all I'm gonna do is raise the power of my factors. Now again, we could still do the same thing. You can set x squared, um, or you could set this to x squared plus four equals zero. You know, x squared plus two equals zero. Now this one's gonna give you a little bit um, different here. Here we'd have x equals plus or minus two i, and here you'd have x is equal to plus or minus i square root of two when you go ahead and solve. Because you're subtracting two, then you're taking the square root. Um, so therefore, you're gonna have some i's here. Now, I prefer just to kind of factor this down. And you'd have x minus two i times x plus two i times x minus um, i squared of two. Uh, and times x plus i. Ah, I knew I was gonna run out of space. i squared of two, okay? And then either way, so that's the linear factorization. However, we already figured out the zeros um, from this case, and this one wasn't as bad. You know, from there, there's a couple, the next two problems actually cause us an issue with the linear factorization. But my main goal is for you to be able to see this and factor it down. See this and be able to factor it down using the difference of two squares across complex numbers. And if you can't see it or you make mistakes, just set them equal to zero and solve. But the next two examples bring us a problem with going, finding the zeros and then writing them as factors. Um, and I'll explain you know, what some groups did. But again, let's count the zeros. We had four, and again, our degree was four. Okay, on to the next one. You can see that um, in this case, again, we have another trinomial, right? It's raised to the fifth power. Um, and you can see I have this coefficient here, negative three. So what I'm gonna do is when I set this equal to zero, I'm going to factor out the negative three as well as rearrange it into standard form. So I'm actually gonna factor out a negative three x because you can see they all have an x here. And that's gonna leave me with a x to the fourth um, let's see here, that's going to be a minus x squared, and that's gonna be a minus two, okay? And again, I see that this factored form in terms of a quadratic here, um, that can be factored into negative two and one. So if I go ahead and say negative three x, and therefore that'd be x squared, or let's just factor it as a quadratic, that'd be minus two and x plus one, right? And then I just raise the powers. Okay, and you can see if you were multiply that, that works. Now, so I had a couple students that went ahead and um, so we already, here we have the minus two and here we have the plus one. So some students already recognize, oh, that's plus or minus i. You know, in this case, if you set negative three x equal to zero, you're just gonna get x is equal to zero. But the, the main important problem that a lot of students did is if they set this equal to zero, well, the linear factorization is not just the zeros written as factors, right? You gotta make sure that when you're doing the linear factorization that you still have this, this negative three here. 
So, you know, negative three times X, this can be factored down, which my goal, if you, you know, like what I'm basically doing is adding two to the other side and then taking the square root. So it's a positive two. So therefore that's gonna be X minus the square root of two times X plus the square root of two. And again, if you're not sure how I got those, set them equal to zero and solve. Here I'd have X uh, minus I and then X plus I, because if I put a one to the other side, it's gonna be negative. So therefore you can see my linear factorization and then my zeros are going to be zero. And let's see, plus or minus the square root of two and plus or minus I. Okay, and again, a lot of, you know, one of those big mistakes students will make is they'll add like negative three as a zero. But again, like you gotta think about this. We have two uh, complex zeros. We have two uh, irrational zeros, jeez. And we have um, one rational zero, zero, right? But again, that adds up to five. If negative three is a zero, then we'd have six zeros, right? And it doesn't make sense, like think of like a quadratic. A quadratic has a maximum number of two x-intercepts, right? It wouldn't make sense for a quadratic to have three x-intercepts. So, um, you know, that's why we start following this rule, like the number of zeros is gonna be equal to that degree, always under complex and, um, and real zeros. But just remember that negative three, that provides a reflection and a vertical stretch. That does not give us, um, that does not provide a zero. That's not written in factored form like the X or all the rest of those. So just be careful with that. Now, now the next one, I'll, I'll kind of maybe show what students will do. So this is the preferred method, but now let's kind of look at a different way that students might've done it where they would have gotten it wrong. So anyways, we have a, in this case, we have a polynomial with four terms. So most students, you notice, know, kind of group them and they didn't want to change it to an addition problem. You just want to write it as grouping. Um, in this case now, we can't really factor anything out except for an x squared. So by factor on x squared, we're left with a three x plus two. In this case, you could go ahead and factor out, um, actually this wouldn't be the same. No, never mind. that was only that problem and that problem. Um, here you could factor out a four and that'd give you a three x plus two, okay? Now you can see the three x plus two is a common term. So I'm going to factor that out. And that's gonna leave me with a x squared plus four. Now I can just, all I really need to do is factor out the x squared plus four, which I already did here, right? And so you can see once you start getting these patterns, once you start doing them, you already recognize this is x minus two i x plus two i. I don't need to set it equal to zero again. And that's kind of like my idea here of, you know, students working through these problems. You know, I show it to you once, but you'll see a lot of the same answers keep on repeating. So to hopefully save ourselves some time and some work, you know, I'm just gonna go ahead and write the factored form. Um, obviously now I'm gonna set these equal to zero and solve, so this would be a negative two thirds, and this would be plus or minus two i. Okay, so those are our factoring techniques. You know, again, look for two terms, look for difference of two squares. Trinomials, look to factoring like as a quadratic trinomial, and obviously when you have four terms, you're gonna to wanna to be looking into your grouping technique. Um, and then after that, we kind of went back into the division problems. And, you know, one of the things that students remembered from division was, you know, when you have a factor, we're looking at long division and zeros, we're looking at um, synthetic division. But when the, when the factor produces a integer um, as a zero, then typically synthetic division was gonna be our preferred thing. So again, if this is a factor, then X equals negative two, and let me just do this one more time, right? To find the zero, like if, um, so a factor, if x plus two is a factor, then x plus two is equal to zero. So therefore x equals negative two is a zero. And the reason why I'm just writing that extra is because now we say, oh, we have a zero. So I could use long division if I wanted to, but I prefer kind of using synthetic division. So let's put a negative two here. <laughs> And then let's go ahead and figure out what this would be. So again, synthetic division, you're gonna take the coefficients. Okay, um, bring down the one. One times negative two is negative two. That becomes negative four. Remember you add, on, add vertically multiplying the diagonal. Negative four times two is going to be a positive eight. That becomes a five. Five times two is negative 10. That becomes a negative 20. Something is wrong because I should get a positive 20, so what did I do here? That becomes a positive eight, that's a positive five, that's a negative 10. Jeez, oh, what did I do? Negative two, because it's one. One times negative two is negative four. I've done this problem like eight times, <laughs> and now now I'm making it, oh, tw 
1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 10. That's a negative 40. No wonder. Jeez, I was trying. I was going crazy. Um, so yes, that becomes a positive 40, which gives us a remainder of zero. And again, like the reason why um, I knew there was a mistake is because it says it's a factor. Therefore, it has to have a remainder of zero, right? Um, now, let's go ahead and see if that means if this, if x plus 2 now divides into this, then that means this is also a factor. So let's go and take a look at what that is. So remainder, constant, linear, quadratic, cubic, right? So again, if that's a factor, right? And again, this this conversation that I have all the time with students, you know, if I say, you know, uh, 3 divides into 12 4 times, then 3 times 4 is equal to 12, right? Well, another name we have for, you know, we can call our function, let's call it f of x. So if f of x, if x plus 2 divides into this polynomial this many times, which is going to be x cubed minus 4x squared, because remember, synthetic division just gives us the coefficients, plus 5x minus 20, right? So that's like your 12, that's your 3, and that's your 4. It's like the same idea, okay? Um, obviously, this has no relationship with 12, 3, and 4. I just wanted to kind of break into that concept. Well, now we can just break down this linear factorization, right? Well, obviously that's a linear factor. This is not a linear factor, but we can factor this down. So if I have x plus 2, then I can rewrite this as x cubed minus 4x squared plus 5x minus 20. And then here you can factor out a, let's see what, an x squared. Let's get him to give us an x minus 4. Here we can factor out a positive 5. That's going to leave with x minus 4. And now we can factor that down. x plus 2 times x minus 4 times x squared plus 5. Okay, and then obviously now know that if you, you could either factor this down or if we were to set this equal to 0, which you know some students may still need to do, set that equal to 0. Let's just kind of do it um, here. If I have x squared plus 5 equals 0, so that means x squared is equal to negative 5, square root, square root, x equals plus or minus i square root of 5. Okay, so therefore the factored form here is x plus 2 times x minus 4 times x, oh, did I write the, oh, I'll just practice it, plus i square root of 5 and x minus i square root of 5. Now, I don't think I wrote said to write the linear factorization form, but I think it's important just to at least see it. So now we can just kind of go from negative 2, 4, plus or minus i, square root of 5. Um, so therefore, I'm not going to do the linear factorization for all of them, but hopefully you can kind of see how we got to those answers. All right, so for the next one, this is being changed to a negative 1, okay? So we're going to be dealing with the kind of same idea here, um, but now we have two zeros, and again, they're integers. So I'm going to want to do Synthetic division. So let's go ahead and pick one. It doesn't matter which one you choose. Um, again, when you're doing synthetic division, make sure that you're using descending powers or make sure your um, polynomial is descending powers. And then also, if you have a missing term, make sure you use zero, right? If there's no x squared there, you'd need to use a place value of zero. So that's supposed to be a negative one. You could use two first if you want to. And again, I encourage students when we were doing this, you know, to pick whatever one I wasn't doing to do the other one and see how it works. Um, but again, when we do synthetic division, you know, we better get a remainder zero, right? Because it's saying these are zeros. So I bring down my one. One times negative one is negative one. Negative four. Four. Six. Negative six. Negative four. Positive four. Zero. Perfect. Um, all right, so now let's go ahead and write that out. I thought that was a different one. Hmm, maybe I did two last time, that's probably why. Um, so I have a remainder, constant, linear, quadratic, and cubic. Now the last time we could factor this, right? But as I go ahead and write this out, I see that this is non-factorable. I can't factor that, further factor that down. However, since I have another zero, what I can do is I can apply synthetic division again. So now I'm just going to take the other zero and I'm going to break it down. Now, one of the key questions students say is, you know, why are you not using the 1, negative 3, 2, 2, and negative 4 again? And, you know, the question is, if you think about it with real numbers, you know, it kind of makes sense why we're not doing that. So if I said, like, what is the prime factorization of 12, right? 
Well, if I want to find the prime factors, all the, you know, the, the foundation of 12, like what are all the prime fact numbers that multiply to give us 12? If I just divide two by, if I just divide 12 by two, I'm going to get six. If I divide 12 by six, I'm just going to get two. So if I'm just dividing these polynomials by only negative one and two, I'm just going to get the other answer like that. And that's not going to further break it down. However, if I take two, if I take 12 divided by two, that gives me six. And then I take six and I divide it by three, another factor, right? That's gonna now produce my linear fact or my prime factorization. So you divide it by one number first and then you divide it by another factor and you can further break it down. So it's that same concept and idea that we're dealing with polynomials. So I divided you know, negative one or x plus one as the factor into that polynomial, I got this factor. Right now, I'm going to take another zero and divide that into that factor to further break it down. So when I do that, I get one. One times two is two. Negative two. This becomes a negative four. Two. Two times two is four, and I get zero. So therefore, I look at this and I say, all right, great. So now I have x. Oh, let's do remainder, constant, linear, quadratic. So now I get an x squared minus 2x plus 2. That's at least a quadratic. So now I know I either I can factor it or use the quadratic formula, right? We don't want to use the quadratic formula here because it's not quadratic. Um, and I quickly try to see if factorable and I say, crap, it is non-factorable. So let's go ahead and just understand though, at least from what we're given right now, we know that f of x is x minus 2 times x plus 1 times x squared minus 2x plus 2, right? But the only way to break this down is to find, like the only way to write, to find the factors here would be to find the zeros using quadratic formula. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so by using the quadratic formula here, I'm gonna have two plus or minus the square root of negative two squared minus four times one times two all over two times one. Okay, so that's gonna be two plus or minus, let's see, four minus eight, so that's gonna be negative four over two. Again, we can use that imaginary unit system, so that's gonna be two plus or minus two i divided by two, right? The square root of four is two, and square root of negative one, i. So therefore, divide that two into both of those, or, or you know, sometimes, just remember, it looks like this. Like that two divides into both those terms. Since I have all this extra space, I'm just gonna use it. So x equals one plus or minus i. Now, I just really wanted to find the zeros. Actually, you know what, just to practice. Did I do that in class? I can't remember. Yeah, I think I did. Um, just go ahead and practice finding the linear factorizations here. Let's go ahead and write those as factors. Right, and again, all I'm gonna do is set them now equal to zero. So it's just subtract the one, subtract the i. Subtract the one, add the i. So therefore you get a factor of x minus one minus i and x minus one plus i. Okay, and a lot of students have trouble with this. That's why I'm just kind of going through the linear factorization again. But if I want to find the zeros, I'm gonna have two, negative one, and then x minus one plus or minus i. Okay, um, so those would be your two zeros at least for that one. So just remember, again, you know, you've, if you have something with synthetic division, keep on using it. Um, and then obviously just make sure it's either factorable or use the quadratic formula when it's a quadratic. All right, but the last one here is we now come into an I and most students don't wanna do synthetic division with I. I used to teach it that way, but most students would just make so many mistakes and it took them so long, I just avoided using it. So again, let's go through our understanding of, you know, if X equals negative two is a zero, then x equals positive 2i is a zero, and x plus 2i and x minus 2i are factors, right? So that's very, very important for us to understand. If we're given this information, we understand, remember, whenever negative, negative i showed up, i positive i is there. Whenever positive i is there, negative i is there. So, we have to make sure we understand that they, um, they're what we call coming our conjugate pairs. They always come together. And that again comes from, how did we arrive at i? We arrived at i by introducing the square root of a negative number, right? So we're introducing that square root, we're using plus or minus. And that was the same thing for the irrational numbers. Um, so therefore, if we have the negative, we know the positive is there. And also we can write, you know, we wrote factors. If we're given a factor, set it equal to zero and solve, it's the zero. 
So therefore, if I know the zeros, I can also write them as the factors. Now, again, the kind of important thing here is going to our understanding of, you know, this linear factorization that I did here before. So if 2 and 3 are factors of 12, well, 2 times 3 gives us 6, which is not larger than 12, right? So therefore, 2 times 3 are factors of 12, and the product, which is 6, is also going to be a factor of 12. So if I multiply, you know, x plus 2i and x minus 2i, now, I did this distributed pro I did this in my head with a lot of my students, and I know as a lot of them were not liking this. So I'm actually going to work this one out so, at least once, so then I can say I did it. So x times x is x squared. This becomes a negative x negative um, x times negative 2i. Actually, I'll just write that as a negative 2ix. This becomes a positive 2ix, and then 2 times negative 2 is a negative 4 i times i is i squared, okay? But it's important, guys, whenever you have a, a two binomials, one's positive, one's negative, but they have the exact same terms, the middle terms are gonna add to zero. Negative, i squared, remember, is negative one, so negative one times negative four is a positive four. So hopefully you guys can recognize here, um, you know, when we start doing these, that that is going to produce that binomial. So anyways, this factor times this factor gives me x squared. But again, remember, this needs to divide into something to the fourth power. So again, it's kind of the same thing. Can x squared divide into x to the fourth? Yes. So that means x squared plus four is also a factor. Okay? And that's the factor I'm going to want to use for long division. I'm not going to want to use division of x plus 2i, x minus 2i. At least so that's what I'd have to be doing for synthetic division. So when I use long division, I'm going to want to use x squared plus four. So let's go ahead and set that up. plus 2x cubed, and then see where it takes us. 5x squared plus 8x plus 4. Okay, so x squared divides in x to the fourth, x squared times. And again, you can always check your work because when you multiply it back, you got to multiply x squared times both terms. You better get the exact same, right? You, gotta, you better get x to the fourth. x squared times x squared is obviously x to the fourth. It better be the same. A lot of times people will say 2 or something. Well, 2 times x squared is not x to the fourth. They need to be exactly the same because you're going to subtract them x squared times 4 is going to be a positive 4x squared. All right, so now we group, subtract our rows. Obviously, there's nothing for me to subtract here from the 2x cubed, so I'm just going to bring it down. This becomes a positive x squared, and then I can just bring down the 8x and 4 for accounting reasons. x squared divides into 2x cubed here. That's going to be a positive 2x times. 2x times x squared is 2x cubed. 2x times 4 is a positive 8x. Again, subtract our rows here. x squared times anything is just going to be, or nothing is x squared plus four. x squared divides into x squared a positive one time. One times x squared is x squared. One times four is four. Again, you can subtract your rows and we're getting that zero which we need, right? That's that very, very important at the end, remainder of zero. So again, x squared plus four divides into this polynomial x squared plus two x plus one times. So let's just practice again writing this linear factorization. So x squared plus four times x squared plus two x plus one. Now again, do we know what this factor is? Yeah, we already know, like we already did it, right? So we can factor that down. And then is this factorable or do we need to use the difference of two squares? Well, thankfully this is factorable. And this is x plus two i, this is x minus two i. And this one is x plus one squared. Now it's very important to recognize here um, that when we're identifying the zeros here, we're going to have plus or minus 2i, and that represents the multiplicity here, right? So therefore, we're going to have negative 1 with a multiplicity equal to 2. Now, this one kind of brings up a very important point here because, um, you know, so far we've always been talking about the number of zeros, complex or real, always adds up to 4, right? Always adds up to the degree of the polynomial. Well, in this case, we only have three zeros, right? Positive i, negative i are positive 2i, negative 2i, and negative 1. However, remember, this is a repeated 0, right? x squared plus 1 is really x plus 1 times x plus 1, right? It's just repeated. So there really are actually four zeros. It's just this one got repeated. So remember, this, this still is the same number. Um, the number of zeros still adds to the degree, but that also includes multiplicity or the repeated zeros. 
And just remember the repeated zeros, you know, you can't have more than one x-intercept at negative one. So what that does, that changes the behavior, right? So it behaves like its power at that x-intercept or the easy way to remember it, if it's even, it bounces, if it's odd, it's going to cross. All right, um, then we kind of went into just a quick little, you know, sum and difference of two cubes because um, just kind of know these, recognize these relationships. Um, and I think it's helpful to also recognize, you know, most students, we see the difference of two squares and we're reckon and we're used to the square numbers, right? So we have four, you know, nine, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, and 100, right? And again, these are squared numbers because they are numbers, you know, raised or multiplied by themselves, okay? So when we're looking for a difference of two cubes, we're looking for either obviously a variable raised to the third power, and we're also looking for you know certain numbers that can be used as well. So it's just important, I think, for students to you know recognize what are some of the common numbers, obviously, that um, we can experience here for that. So common numbers here, we have eight, which is two cubed. Um, we're going to have 27, which is three cubed. We have 64, which is going to be uh, four cubed. And then we have 125, which is going to be five cubed. And I don't really get into um, that anymore. I think 216, if I remember. Yes, um, so I think 216 is also works, but I don't really get to anything really higher than that. But again, if you see one of these numbers, just recognize you can write one of these numbers as a um, as a number raised to the third power. Now that's important because if you're following these, you know, formulas, um, it's important. It's important to understand that they that we can use these because here's the kind of trap that students get. So we go ahead and say, let's go ahead and find all of the zeros here. You know, find all the zeros. Now. If you're paying attention for this lesson, you know there has to be three zeros. But if you kind of go back to our first problem that we did, most students will say, well, why don't I just set this equal to zero? Subtract the one here. So I get x cubed equals negative one. Take the cube root. And therefore, x equals negative one. And again, that is a zero, but that is just your real zero. That does not produce the other two zeros here. We know there has to be three, right? Or at least every single problem we've done, there has to be three. So what we can do though, is if we can write this in terms of a cube number, so x cubed plus one cubed, we can now represent this in the difference of two cubes, or at least the formula from up here. So by following the formula, I can say zero equals x plus one times x squared minus x times one plus one squared. So basically all I'm doing is I'm setting a cubed plus b cubed. So we can say a is equal to x here and b is equal to x. I'm sorry, b is equal to a, b, one is equal to a, b. Okay, um, so therefore we get zero equals uh, x plus one times x squared minus x plus one. And therefore, we still have negative one as our zero, but to go ahead and find the other zeros, we're gonna to need to use the um, quadratic formula again. So let's just kind of do this really quickly. One plus or minus, let's see, that's going to be one, um, one negative one squared is one, minus four times one times one. So that's gonna be a negative three um, and divided by two, two times one, which is two. So therefore, x equals one plus or minus that becomes a one minus three is a negative three. So therefore that's going to be i square root of three over two. So if I was just gonna write the zeros here, just to save myself a time, we still have negative one, but then it's just gonna be one plus or minus i square root of three over two. Just remember everything's over two. You can distribute the two if you wanted to, but just for the sake of time, I'm gonna leave that off there, okay? Uh, but it's just important to understand we have to get those other two zeros and that's why it's important here to uh, understand that difference of, two, difference of two cubes. Now again, in this example, 
we don't want to say that like here is my first term cubed. What we want to do is we want to be able to write this in terms of a cubed number minus another cubed number. Right? So now you can see that a is going to equal 2x and b is going to equal 1. All right? Because again, in this exact example, you know, from the last time, you know, 2x cubed is 8x cubed, right? That's why I provide. So that's why we want to look out for those kind of numbers, the 8, 27, these, because then we can rewrite them as a number cubed, and therefore to go ahead and apply the formula. So let's go ahead and set this equal to zero, just like the last one. And therefore I'd have 2x uh, minus 1 times 2x squared uh, plus, let's see, 2x times 1 plus 1 squared. So there we go, 0 equals 2x minus 1. And then this is going to be a 4x squared plus 2x plus 1. Okay, so again, we have the same idea. We know we're going to have our 0 here. x is equal to um, 1 half, which would have been the exact same case if we would have just you know solved it using numerous operations. But now we need to go ahead and solve this. So therefore, I'm going to have a negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 2 squared, which is 4, minus 4 times a times c, all divided by 2 times 4, which is 8. So I'm just kind of moving a little bit quicker here just to kind of get along here. So we have negative 2 plus or minus, let's see here, um, that's going to be a negative 16. So 4 minus 16 is a negative 12, divided by 8. And that can simplify to a negative 2 plus or minus. I can simplify that radical. I could break that up into a negative 4 times 3. So therefore, that's going to be a 2i times the square root of 3 over 8. And let's go ahead and simplify that one more time. So the 8 uh, can reduce to, if I divide everything by 2 here, um, or actually, let's distribute that. So that this reduces to a negative 1 fourth plus or minus. This reduces to a one-fourth i times the square root of three. So by writing these zeros now, that one's easy, right? I like that one, one-half. And then this one's going to be a negative one-fourth plus or minus one-fourth i times square root of three. And there you go. All right, so that's basically our way for finding zeros or at least our complex number system. And again, we'll get to these. Now we're going to get into the point of, you know, why understanding that these three zeros is so important. Um, but we learned basically following the sum and difference of two cubes, that at least the formula, factoring and using division as well as non-factoring um, to go ahead and find the zeros. So now let's go ahead and just look at some, some further things that's going to round up our understanding. So the first two is the rational zero test, which basically gives us a list of the rational zeros that a polynomial can have. So as we look at, you know, back at some answers here real quick. Um, da -da, let's go back. So just because we have zeros doesn't mean they're all rational, right? You could have complex zeros, you could have irrational zeros, but we could have rational zeros, right? They could be zero, plus or minus one, plus or minus negative two thirds. So all the rational zero test tells us is that if you have rational zeros, again, it's a possibility theorem. It doesn't tell you if you have rational zeros or not. It just says if there's going to be rational zeros, it has to come from this list of numbers, which is basically the plus or minus the factors of the constant over, so the zeros have to come plus or minus the factors. And we use P over Q, but again, that's really going to be the factors of your constant the last hour over your coefficient or your leading coefficient. All right, and a lot of times we use to remember that is our P over Q. So that's what a lot of times I like to just kind of recognize for them. Um, so in this case, we say that is our constant and our leading coefficient here is one. Now again, it's the list of all the possible answers. So let's just go ahead and do, you know, plus or minus here, P over Q. And all you're simply gonna do is, I usually like to write plus or minus and then outside parentheses, is just list the factors of four. So the factors of four are four, two, and one. And the factors of one are just one. Now this one's rather easy because now we're just gonna write this out. I'm gonna write this one out though, um, just so you can kind of see what I'm doing. As plus or minus four over one, comma, plus or minus two over one, 
comma, plus or minus one over one. And you can see by writing the plus or minus for every single one is kind of redundant. So that's why a lot of times we'll just write plus or minus. And then obviously we don't need to write these divided by four. It's just gonna be four, two, and one, right? We don't need to write them divided by one. But for the other examples, you'll see how that can be helpful. Um, so again, this doesn't really tell us anything else except that if we have a rational zero, then it has to be one of these numbers. And really the reason why this would be a bene uh, beneficial um, task for us to use, it would be like if we were gonna need, like if we didn't know what the zeros were, then obviously we could go ahead and test them, right? We could test them by using division, but you're not gonna wanna use division, you know, for like, for this example, for three, like three is not a potential zero because it doesn't, it's not on the rational zero test. That's why we'd want, we would test like plus one, negative one, plus two, negative two, and use division or the remainder theorem with those zeros. So that's why the rational zero test can be helpful for us. Um, all right, let's go ahead and do another one. So again, we have P and we have Q. So plus or minus, the factors of P are three and one. The factors of Q here are two and one. So this one's gonna look like three over two, three over one. One over two and one over one. So I can just simplify this again to three halves, three, one half, and one. And that is just the list of all possible zeros. Remember, it's always gonna be plus or minus. Um, and again, you know, this is helpful because I could say like, is, you know, two a zero? Well, no, you don't even need to test it. It's not in the rational zero test, right? Um, and, but also it's important that, you know, or again, you know, this has a power to the fourth power, right? So therefore we know that um, there ha there's only gonna be four zeros, right? So this doesn't tell us, you know, this is eight zeros right there. Not all of those, or none of them could be zeros, right? So the rational zero test has just given us a possibility. All right, now let's play, let's have some fun with some factors that have a little bit more. So there's my P, that's my Q. So the factors of six are six, three, two, one. Factors of Q are four, two, and one. All right, so now let's go ahead and write this out. This one's gonna be a little bit longer here. So therefore we have six over four, six over two, six over one, three over four, three over two, three over one, two over four, two over two, two over one, one over four, uh, one over two, and one over one. So you can see how obviously built, you know, this adds up a lot. Now again, we wanna simplify this, right? And if we have redundant zeros, we don't need to write them twice. So therefore, I'm just gonna kinda of work from left to right. I like to sometimes practice writing them out so you do, therefore you don't miss any. Um, but again, like we don't need to rewrite, you know, if we have three halves come up again, which we do right there, we don't need to write it twice. So therefore that gives us three six, and a lot of times also it's helpful sometimes to write them in like ascending or descending order. See, I already have three halves, but I already have it, so I don't need to worry about it. I have three, I already have it. Two over four reduces to one half. Two over two reduces to one. This reduces to two. One fourth is a new one. We already want to have one half and we already have one. So therefore, there is your list of possible rational zeros. All right, and let's get to the last one here. Again, a P over Q. So we have the factors of four um, are going to be plus or minus four, two, and one. And the factors of eight are gonna be eight, four, two, and one. And again, now we're just gonna list here, all right? So we're gonna do the same thing, plus or minus, four over eight, four over four, four over two, four over one. Then we have two over eight, two over four, two over two, and two over one. And last but not least, one over eight, one over four, one over two, and one over one. All right, so now we're just going to simplify this. That becomes two a one half. Um, that's a one, that's a two, four, that's a one fourth. One half, I already have. One, I already have. Two, I already have. One eighth. Um, one fourth, I already have. One half, I already have. And one. So you can see there's a lot of redundancy in that one. 
But therefore, you can see how this broke down, right? And you can see that it's just going to be the list of all your rational zeros. All right, so the next one that students don't like, again, is Descartes' rule of signs. Because Descartes' rule of signs, again, is not really telling us much. It's just telling us what is possible for our zeros. So it doesn't tell us what our zeros are. It doesn't tell us how many zeros. It just tells us what is possible. And I didn't write that in there, but it's the, really the number of possible real zeros um, that you're going to get. And that's really important because, you know, it's rather simple. Right? All you're going to do is just count the number of sign changes minus an even number. But one of the things that students have trouble with is why are we subtracting an even number? Well, again, you can't subtract one or you can't subtract three because let's say if they're not real, let's say they're complex. Complex zeros always come in conjugate pairs, plus and minus i, right? So therefore, that's why they're always going to come in pairs of twos. And that's why when you're subtracting, you're going to be subtracting two. Um, now, in terms of the complex zeros, that's going to be based off of understanding the fundamental theorem of algebra, which is something I have been, you know, talking about from this, really this whole lesson here, is that a polynomial function of degree n will have n zeros, including complex and real. So whatever the degree of the polynomial is, that is how many zeros we're going to have. And just remember that some of those zeros may be repeated, right? That is what we call our multiplicity. But Understanding the fundamental theorem of algebra is obviously not only important for this whole chapter, but it's also important for, under, for finding the number of complex zeros for Descartes' rule of signs, which we'll go ahead and explain. So the question really here is, you know, find the possible real negative, real positive, and uh, complex zeros. So to do this, you know, to find the number of real positive, all we're going to do is count the number of sign changes. And you're going to say three or one. Again, you're subtracting the even number. It doesn't tell you. Remember, Descartes' rule of signs is not giving you how many real positive zeros you have. It's just telling what's possible. It's saying there could be three real positive zeros or there could be one real zero. We don't know. It's just those are going to be your two possibilities. Now, to find the real negative, we got to figure out what f of negative x is. Now, for the rest of these, I'm going to do these in my head, but I'll do it for the first one. I'll just kind of show you what I'm doing. Because a lot of students, you know, still make their one mistake is going to be on the plugging in. And once you make a mistake here, you're kind of doomed, right? So we don't want you to be making a mistake here. Um, we want to, you know, if you need to write it out like I'm doing, then write it out. Just remember, guys, anytime you have a negative number raised to an even power, that's going to make it positive. So that's a positive x to the fourth. Anytime you have a negative raised to an odd power, it's going to be negative. But here we have a negative times a negative. So that's why that is a positive term. Let's do the third power. This becomes positive times a positive, so that's a positive 2x squared. This becomes a negative 2x minus 4. Okay, And here, you can see that there's only one sign change. So for the number of real negative, there's 1. Now, you can't subtract an even number from 1, right? Because obviously, this is the number of real zeros. It doesn't make sense to have a, you know, a negative number of zeros. So there has to be one negative. Has to be. Now, again, um, we don't know. Um, how many real positive? We have this option, three or one. Well, let's pretend it's three. If there's three zeros, three real positive, and there's one real negative, that is four. That's a total of four zeros, right? By the fundamental theorem of algebra, we can't have any more zeros. So for the number of complex in that, in that option would be zero, right? However, since we don't know if it's three or one, what if there was one real positive? If there is one real positive, we have to have one real negative. That's a total of two zeros. That means we have to now have two complex, right? Because two complex plus one plus one is four. We can't have any more, right? We can't have four complex because we have had four complex. We wouldn't have any real positive, real negative. But again, we have to have you know, one real negative and at least one real positive or three. Therefore, the number of complex is just going to be zero or two. Let's go ahead and do it again. So to find the number of real positive, let's count the sign changes. So it doesn't really matter what the power is. You know, in this case, we have one, two. So for the real positive, we have two or zero, okay? Because you can subtract zero. You can't have zero number of integers. Um, let's go ahead and do f of negative x. Hopefully, I won't make a mistake here, but that would be 2x to the fourth. Um, that's going to be a positive 7x cubed plus 13x squared minus 11x plus 3. So in this case, we have 2 or 0. So for the number of real negative, this is also 2 or 0. 
So this kind of brings up an interesting case, and this is the one where I like to kind of bring up, you know, the box that I kind of talk with my students. So there's two types of zero, three types of zeros, I'm sorry, Descartes' rule of science talks to us about. We have the real positive, the real negative, and the complex. Now again, there's a lot of options here. We could have two or zero, two or zero. And then we could have complex. Well, if we have two positive and we have two negative, again, look at the degree of your polynomial. It's four, right? So the only number of complex zeros is we have to have zero, right? Because the number of zeros in that column always has to add to four. Now, what if it was zero positive, but we still had two negative? Well, now we'd have to have two complex. What if it was two positive and zero negative? Well, then we'd still have two complex, right? Because it's always gonna add to four. And then the last one is what if there was zero positive, zero negative? Well, again, the number of zeros has to add up to four. So therefore, my number of complex would have to be four. Okay, so you can see that they, they always add up to four each and every way. But again, if we're just looking for the list of possible for our complex numbers, it's going to be zero or two or four. We don't, can't go higher than that, right? Because then that'd be higher than our degree. And based on the fundamental theorem of algebra, we know that cannot be the case. All right, uh, let's just go to do two more. It's kind of fun. Here, you can see there's no sign changes. So there are no real positive. So let's go ahead and look at the negative. So therefore, f negative x here gives us x to the fourth minus 2x cubed plus 5x squared minus 8x plus 4. Ooh, 1, 2, 3, 4. Ah, so we have, so for the number of real negative, it's going to be 4, 2, or 0, right? You could have 4. 2 or 0. So you just keep on subtracting an even number. And you know, the other way I just recommend is just keep on subtracting 2 to either get to an odd number, like a number you can't subtract anymore, or you get to 0. Um, so now let's go and look at the number of complex. Well, again, like since there's no real positive, we're just looking at the number of real complex compared to negative, right? If there's 4 negative, there's 0 complex. If there's 2 negative, there has to be 2 complex. If there's 0 real negative, there has to be Four complex. So you can see how these kind of just play off each other to always give us a, that, a number of four zeros. All right, last one. So this one's to a higher power, to the seventh power, and there's only three terms. Kind of interesting, right? So again, if I'm looking for the number of real positive, one, two. So for a number of real positive, there's only um, two or zero uh, real positive zeros. Now let's go ahead and look at the you know, y of negative x here. That's gonna give me negative x to the seventh. This would be still a negative three x squared plus one. So now the number of real negative is going to be one. Okay, so it's either two or zero and one. Now this is interesting because if you had two real positive and one real negative, that still only gives us three. We, have, we need to get to seven, right? So the number of complex like if we have three and I need to get to seven, then the number complex has to be four, right? I mean, there's no other option here, right? I need four. Well, what if there wasn't real two real positive? What if there was only zero? That means I'd have to have my one real negative and therefore the number of complex would have to equal six. So the main idea, you know, the Descartes rule of signs is it gives you, it helps you understand, you know, when you're doing these problems, you know, how many zeros or what type of zeros you're gonna be looking for. Um, and so it's a good way to kind of guess and check uh, your check your answers um, and then also just to kind of understand the type of, you know, the polynomial and the problem that you're working yourself off of. And I like doing at least a Descartes rule of signs, you know, figuring out the complex numbers in addition to the real positive and real negative because it really um, confirms in with students the understanding of the fundamental theorem of algebra. All right, so now on to the last two equations um, that we have here, which is basically just writing the equation um, given the zeros. So again, when doing this, you know, this is something that we worked in with each and every one of our uh, lessons. And all we simply need to do here is again, just write um, our zeros equal to x. So x equal to two and x equal to i squared of three. But remember, if i squared of three exists, then x equals negative i squared of three has to exist. Um, then I can just set these all equal to zero. Now you don't need to do this, but again, just to kind of make sure students understand how to go from zeros to factors, 
you set them all equal to zero, now you can write your factored form. Now again, we have some multiplicity here. So you wanna make sure you can raise x minus two to the second power. Okay, and if you remember at the beginning of the lesson, I kind of talked about, you know, multiplying this out. I multiplied out step by step because I wanted you to see where that came from. But now um, I, I wanna kind of use our idea, our understanding of the difference of two squares, right? If you have something, you know, a minus b times a plus b, that is basically the first term squared minus the second term squared. Right, so um, that's what we want to do. Now, obviously, if you need to multiply these out on your own, then multiply them out on your own. But you know, the other thing to remember is if you have a binomial, you know, a minus b squared, remember that does not equal a squared minus b squared. Right? <laughs> Those are not the same. You got to make sure you multiply this times a minus b times a minus b, and you actually have to expand that out. A lot of students will take a minus b squared and they'll write it as a squared minus b squared, right? Don't do that. So if you multiply this out, you get an x squared minus 4x plus 4. Here, x times x is going to go, or x squared is going to be x squared. So now we have i squared, which is negative 1, right? And then 3 squared, or square root of 3 times square root of 3, which would be 3. So we have 3 times negative, um, negative or negative one times three, which is negative three, and then you have a minus, so therefore it ends up being a positive three. And again, if you wanna like check my work, obviously multiply it out, or just think about this. If you were to take x squared plus three and set it equal to zero and solve, you would get plus or minus i square root of three. Now we just need to multiply this out. Um, you could use box method, you could use uh, distributive property. In this case, I'm actually gonna use box method just because I'm not gonna use box method for the next one. Well, actually I will, but I'm gonna do a shortcut. So x squared plus three, and then here I have x squared minus four x plus four, and therefore if I multiply this out, I get x to the fourth minus four uh, x cubed plus four x squared plus three x squared minus 12 x plus 12. Um, and we only have one like term here, so therefore my answer, my factor of form is x to the fourth minus four x cubed plus seven x squared minus 12 x plus 12. So even though, you know, definitely probably would have been a little bit faster to use distributive property, I like using the box method just because, you know, not only does it reaffirm what exactly I'm doing when I'm multiplying, um, but also just keeps things a little bit more organized um, for me to use. But, you know, you can see, um, even though it is a great way to understand a lot, um, it does get a little bit, it can get a little confusing. And so therefore, if we do have an option to use a short, short uh, a trick, a shortcut, then maybe we, sometimes it'll be beneficial to use it. So that's what I'll do in this next example. Um, let's just go ahead and talk about our zeros though. We have x equals zero, and we have x equals one minus i. So therefore, x has to equal one plus i. Remember, we set these equal to zero. You don't need to do it for this one, but it's always kind of fun. Again, I just like to do this because students have trouble. It takes them a while to like understand what we're doing here. So then I have f of x equals x minus zero cubed times x minus one plus i times x minus one um, minus i. Okay, so obviously this is x cubed, which is not that difficult, right? But usually students have trouble with this. So um, a couple ways you could do this. You know, what I tell students, if you have a trinomial, then use multiply a trinomial, right? Just break it up as a trinomial times a trinomial. X minus one plus I, you know, X minus one minus I. So therefore this X squared minus X, um, X I, this one becomes negative X, this becomes positive one, that becomes a negative I, you know, negative um, xi, positive i, and this becomes a negative, i times i is i squared, but it's a negative i squared, so it's a positive one. Now, the nice thing about this, hopefully you recognize that we have like terms here, like terms and like terms. Like terms, I didn't wanna cover up another answer. And like terms. And then if you notice here, the negative i and the positive i 
add to zero. The negative xi and the positive xi add to zero. So another way to do this though, if you don't like that or if that was too much work, what you could also do is you could group the first two terms of each of these expressions. And this is the way that I prefer to do it just because it's a little bit faster. And what you recognize is again is this relationship of the difference of two squares. You know, in this case you have a plus b times a minus b. So therefore, I can now just write it as a squared minus b squared. So x minus 1 squared is x minus 1 squared, and this becomes a minus a i squared. Now, this is really only, sorry, it's x cubed. This is really only going to help your case um, if obviously you can multiply x minus 1 cubed, you know, very quickly, which is x squared minus 2x plus 1. i squared is negative 1, so minus negative 1 is plus 1. And therefore, you can see we're going to get the answer that we got from multiplying, um, multiplying this way, right? Because that's a negative 2x and that's plus 2. And you can see that's where it is. And then I'll just finally distribute this and give me x to the fifth minus 2x to the fourth plus 2x cubed. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Now we have covered everything we need to cover for this chapter as far as um, writing our, as far as complex zeros. We talked about writing the equation. We talked about our theorems, our you know fundamental theorem of algebra, Descartes rule of signs, rational zero test. Um, we talked about how to find the zeros when given a factor or zeros, and how to find them using sum and difference of two cubes, as well as from factoring, and as well as using inverse operations and the quadratic formula. So the last thing I ask my students to do is, you know, just kind of go through this, you know, as a reflection um, for what you understand, what you felt was, you know, helpful, and then maybe, and then also write down some things that you, you know, kind of struggle with. So um, if you have any questions that you'd like to provide um, from this lesson, then please feel free to chat, and I'll be happy to answer as when I can. Cheers, guys.